select board meeting of April 13, 2020. Um, as a preliminary matter, this is Diane Mahan, select board chair. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, please, when I call your name, respond in the affirmative. Dan Dunn. I can hear you. Joe Kira. Here. John Hurd. Yes. Steve DeCourcy. Here. Now, staff, call your name. Please respond in the affirmative. Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. Yes, I'm here. Douglas Heim, town council. Present. And Ashley Ma from the select board office is in a remote area taking the minutes. Um, good evening. This is an open meeting of the Arlington Select Board and is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth, given the outbreak of the novel coronavirus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the virus and reduce risk of COVID-19 illness, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings. And as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order which you can find posted with the agenda materials for this meeting allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely, so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. <clears throat> Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment. Even if members of the public do not provide public comment, Participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment, and those persons are not required to identify themselves. For this meeting, the select board is convening by Zoom, as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and that take care not to screen share you your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. Please also take care to adjust your screen or device name if you would like to speak. In order for us to recognize speakers appropriately and develop accurate minutes, it is helpful for participants to see your full first and last name when calling upon you rather than a nickname. All of the materials to this meeting, except any executive session materials, are available on the Novus Agenda dashboard, and we recommend the members and the public follow the agenda as posted on Novus, unless I myself, the chair, otherwise. We will now turn to the first item on the agenda. Before we do so, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. I will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, the chair will go down the line of members inviting each by name to provide any comment, questions, or motions. Please hold until your name is called. Further, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you are not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. If members wish to engage in colloquy with other members, please do so through the chair taking care to identify yourself. This meeting will feature opportunities for public comment on certain agenda on, under Citizens Open Forum. I will ask members of the public who wish to speak for Citizens Open Forum to identify their names and addresses only. Once the chair has a list of all persons wishing to speak on Citizens Open Forum, I will call on each by name and you can speak to up to three minutes. Please keep in mind that all participants and members of the public must be recognized by the chair before speaking and that the board does not typically engage in colloquy in citizens open forum because such items are not on the agenda for discussion and could be a violation of the open meeting law. Finally, each vote as we've done before taken in this meeting will be conducted by a roll call vote by attorney Hein. With that, we go to Agenda item one, sorry, pardon me. I mean, agenda item two, we just completed one. Organizational meeting for the purpose of electing a chair and vice chair. Um, I asked attorney Heim uh, 
to put this on the agenda. And I had conversations with Attorney Heim as well as one of my colleagues, Mr. DeCourcy, who's also an attorney, um, from my understanding, specializing in municipal law, if, if not other fields. And i um, gonna ask Attorney Heim basically to explain it, but when I spoke with Attorney Heim and Attorney DeCourcy in reading uh, the Selectman Handbook, it seemed like there was some ambiguity. And um, Attorney Heim? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, we're, uh, for both members of the board and the public who's listening, we're obviously in very unusual circumstances. One of the uh, pieces of these unusual circumstances that folks may have noticed is that Select Board Administrator uh, Marie Kropelka is not with us. Um, accordingly, under the organizational meeting practice of this board, the uh, Select Board Administrator would typically chair, serve as chair pro tem only for the purposes of the organizational meeting. Um, I'd like to, if the board is comfortable with this, uh, proceed as your pro tem for the purposes of this limited discussion. Um, and I'll provide you with a basic rundown of the context and the board's options. First, uh, yeah. the select board's policy um, is that the chair and vice chair of the board serve for one year. The board's policy, however, is also that the organizational election of a new chair and vice chair happens following the annual town election. As folks probably know, the annual town election has been postponed to June. Accordingly, uh, there's no perfect way to be consistent with the board's past practice. The board can either um, elect a new chair until such time as the election happens and potentially have another election because there will be at least one member of the board who will be changing uh, after the annual town election, or the board can uh, take a vote to maintain the current uh, chair and vice chair until such time as the town election is held. Those are the two primary options. Uh, either option, however, is going to be a partial departure from prior board practice, either a departure because the chair, chair and vice chair only serve for one year, or a departure because um, the organizational meeting and the election of the chair happens after the annual town meeting, uh, annual town election and not before. So with that, I'd like to propose uh, uh, a quick preliminary motion uh, to see, to just confirm that the board is comfortable with uh, me serving as the chair pro tem until uh, the organizational piece of the meeting is over. And with that, um, I will ask for individual board comment on that specific matter only, and then move on to the next piece. So I'll start with uh, Mr. DeCourcy. Mr. DeCourcy, do you have any comment on me serving as uh, uh, as the chair pro tem for the purpose of the organizational meeting? No, I'm, I'm fine with that. Okay. Mr. Hurd? I believe Mr. Hurd is muted. No, nope, fine, fine with me. Mr. Kerr? I'm fine with that. Mr. Dunn? Uh, definitely appropriate. Uh, Ms. Mahan? I definitely agree, and I thank you. Um, I'll take a quick roll call. I, I'll, I'll take a quick motion on this and a roll call. If anybody can just raise their hand and let me know that they're comfortable making that motion. I appreciate it. Mr. Kerr? I, I move to appoint um, <clears throat> Town Council Douglas Heim as uh, chair pro tem for the purposes of the uh, select board's reorganization meeting of uh, April 13, 2020. Second. Okay, Mr. Uh, a motion from Mr. Kuro and a second by Mr. Hurd. Uh, I'll try to be efficient. Is there any discussion? Okay, I'll take a roll call vote on Mr. Uh, Kuro's motion for uh, the town council to serve as the uh, chair pro tem in the absence of the select board administrator. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Kuro? Yes. Mr. Dunn? Yes. Ms. Mahan? Yes. Thank you. Now moving on to the uh, uh, to the main purpose here, the organizational meeting. As I've outlined, the board has, as I see it, two primary options. The board can either uh, opt to take a vote to essentially maintain the current chair and vice chair until such time as the town election is held and the first select board meeting thereafter, 
or the board can choose to elect a new uh, chair and vice chair um, until the town election is, is held. Um, I'll open that up for discussion. Obviously, if there are other points that the board would like to make, they're free, uh, members are free to do so. I'll start with Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Attorney Heim. Um, yeah, so I, I look at this, and you've laid out the, the conflict in, in our handbook very well. Uh, we have the one-year requirement on the one hand, and then we have the uh, organizational meeting that's to take place after the annual town election. And for me, um, the one year needs, in my mind, needs to give way to the annual town election. So I would um, be in favor of maintaining the current chair and, and vice chair until the town election occurs. And whether that's by way of motion or us not doing anything and, and just waiting until after the election occurs, I'm fine either way. But it, it seems to me we're, we're going to have a different board after the election and, and, and the new board should vote who should be the... Um, the officers for the coming year. Mr. Hurt? Yeah, I agree. I think that we should wait until we get the, the new board in order to make the vote. So, you know, I, and I think right now with the way we're conducting meetings, it wouldn't be a good time to change over the leadership of the board right now anyways. So I'm good maintaining the current officers in place. Mr. Kerr? Yeah, I feel like everything's in a state of suspended animation right now. I mean, we've shifted our elections. We're shifting town meeting. Um, it, it only makes sense for us to to maintain this in a in a kind of a state of uh, suspended animation as well. And my only question would be: Is uh, would it be most proper for us to um, make a motion and take a vote to to um, uh, suspend? Uh, that portion of our policy for for this purpose to to um, uh, uh, defer the uh, reorganization meeting until after the uh, and next annual town election. Mr. Kerr, are you asking me to switch my hat, or are you just putting it out there to the board? Uh, I, I think I'm asking you to switch your hat, if that's possible. So I, I certainly think a vote could uh, be to suspend the. Um, board's practice. I want to be clear for folks, the, neither the uh, session law, the special act that provided for the postponement of elections and town meetings, nor the law generally provides a specific guidance for this situation. Uh, it's really the board's practice in terms of chair and vice chair uh, that's, that's at issue. So you could articulate the motion in that way if you so chose, uh, Mr. Carroll. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I do so choose. I, I move to suspend our policies for the purposes of uh, deferring our um, reorganization meeting until uh, our first meeting following the um, annual town election. Mr. Dunn? Uh, I'm happy to serve, and, uh, I don't, and I'm happy to do the as the rest of the board wishes. No opinion. Ms. Mahan? Um. First, for purposes of the record, I'll second Mr. Carroll's motion to um, spend um, and basically follow one of the two um, outlines areas in our handbook. And I only wanted to do this because uh, just thinking about everything, um, need to have some clarity on it where it is kind of says two, two different ways and technically it didn't have to have this as an agenda item, but I did want to do it that it was an agenda item just because there was that ambiguity out there. And I would leave it to the future chair, um, whomever that is, that when appropriate further on down the road, um, this particular, and I would ask attorney Heim um, and, and Ms. Marr to uh, sort of put it on the tickler file that we uh, amend, update, uh, the select board handbook should a circumstance like this happen again so that you know we a future board would not have to go through these steps thank you thank you Ms. Mahan so as I understand it there's a motion from Mr. Kuro to suspend the board's uh, policy of the chair and vice chair only uh, serving for one year uh, until such time as uh, there should be a town election and there's a second by Ms. Mahan. Mr. Kuro, have I artic correctly articulated your motion? You have, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Are there any other points of discussion by members of the board? Okay. 
If so, I'll take a roll call vote. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Kuro. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Ms. Mahan. Yes. It's a unanimous vote, and I so declare it. Um, with that, I would uh, also take a motion to uh, close the organizational meeting uh, and note that uh, Ms. Mahan and Mr. Dunn uh, continue to serve as chair and vice chair of the select board, respectively. Is there anyone wishing to make that motion? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Kiro, is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. DeCourcy. Um, on Mr. Kuro's motion to uh, terminate the organizational meeting and return to a uh, uh, regular meeting, I'll take a roll call vote, Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Kuro? Yes. Mr. Dunn? Yes. Ms. Mahan? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, you, Attorney Hunt. So declare. Thank you to my colleagues. I will not next go to agenda item three, consent agenda, minutes of the me meetings, March 23rd, 2020 and March 30th, 2020. First, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Uh, Mr. Carroll, seconded by Mr. Hurd. Um, any uh, questions, additions, deletions from my colleagues on the board? Uh, seeing none on a motion by Mr. Carroll, seconded by Mr. Hurd, move approval of the minutes. Uh, Attorney Heim, roll call. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Kuro. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Ms. Mahan. Yes. 5 0, unanimous vote. Um, we will now enter into citizen. Speak if you can use the wave this hand. This meeting is I'm being recorded now, and I'll read the preamble. Except in unusual circumstances, any matter presented for the consideration of the board shall neither be acted upon nor decision made the night of the presentation in accordance with the policy under which the open forum was established. It should also be noted that there is a three minute time limit to present a concern or request. I'm just going to give that a minute so we can collect and gather that list, which I'm not doing, someone else is. And I, I would note, uh, Chair, if I may, that um, I, it doesn't appear as though there is anybody calling in, um, but if someone was to be calling in, they could hit star nine on their phones to be able to utilize the raise hand feature. Uh, so just to make note of that. And I, I'll tell you uh, right now, we have three hands raised right now. Of, okay, uh, because it's open right now. Yep, in this in the order of uh, Sean Harrington, mm -hmm. Lynette Martin, and Elizabeth Dre. Thank you. I'm gonna give it like 20 more seconds because technically you're supposed to be in the room for the meeting. <laughs> okay, anyone else, um, Mr. Chaplain? That, that is all I see right now. Okay, so, um, and my vice chair, Mr. Dunn, is also going to um, assist me on this. First, we have Sean Harrington, just for the audio record. Name and address for the record, please. Can you hear me? Just making sure my mic's working. Yes, sir. Sean Harrington, 16 Lafayette Street, Precinct 4. Um, uh, two things. One, I'm... Uh, wanted to address uh, the uh, health department notice in regards to, <clears throat> excuse me, in regards to uh, masks being worn in grocery stores and convenience stores. I think it's important that we're taking health action, but I think that the things I've been seeing quite a lot of in town are individuals touching their masks still with their hands, individuals not knowing how to properly take off masks. And I think that if we're going to be implementing this type of policy, it's important that the town take action to try and educate um, the residents on how to properly take off masks, not touch your face just because you have a mask on still. And also if you have a scarf or you're using things like that to clean thoroughly because most people don't think of right away taking a scarf and cleaning it. The other thing is, is um, and now an outgoing member of the uh, election modernization committee uh, we got a lot of feedback from citizens about uh, the dates and uh, the priest in regards to voting areas. Um, 
one thing I think that we got from it was that there was some concern about how many polling locations are gonna be open. I strongly suggest to the board that we keep as many polling locations open as possible. Um, the idea, I know some people have talked about having one polling location as a means to uh, make it have less people work the polls, but in my opinion, one location or even just two locations, quite frankly, makes it a lot easier for one individual COVID-19 to come in and get everybody else sick. Uh, mm -hmm. That's for everything you're doing so far. I think the town's done a great job leading as well as Governor Baker in this crisis. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we have Lynette Martin. If you could just, for the audio record, say your name and address. Hi, my name is Lynette Martin, 18 Eustace Street. Thank you. Um, so I participated in the election modernization meeting the other evening, um, and there was a lot of concern and anxiety about how the elections are gonna be held. Um, there's a lot to figure out in a short amount of time, and there were a lot of creative ideas to be explored. I was wondering if there'll be a place where citizens can collaborate on that with the select board members or some of the select board members. Um, such as how will the poll workers be protected? And also um, the hours, there was concern about consolidating the hours, uh, you know, trying to keep stuff the same as possible and maybe even extending the hours of the days so that um, there's less crowding. But also uh, there's a lot of concern about how we're gonna get this message out to people. Um, uh, it would be good if we can reach out to people in low-income housing. Um, and then lastly, on a separate note, I was wondering if Arlington has any plans to protect our low-wage low workers employed in Arlington as essential businesses, stuff like um, sanitizing the benches at bus stops as it impacts both low-wage workers and our food services, as well as our elderly. So uh, what efforts the town might be doing on those things. Um, and then if we are gonna revise the poll locations and hours, how we will, um, communicate that out and comply with the need to publicize it 20 days before the election. So those are all things I just want to bring up. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. And <clears throat> while we outlined that we don't go back and forth in the Q&A, both your comments, Ms. Martin and Mr. Harrington and possibly Ms. Drace, um, um, I think a lot of them on the ne next agenda item will give most of that information, but um, We'll get to that when we get to that agenda item. Thank you. I don't want anyone to think we're just not um, taking heed. Um, next, we have Elizabeth Dre. And if you could just for the audio record. Madam Chair, I don't think I think we're having a muting problem right now. How about now? Good. I heard you there. Oh, perfect. Thank you. So good evening, uh, Chairwoman Mahan. My name is Elizabeth Dre, 130 Jason Street. Thank you for having us uh, here to this evening. It feels kind of weird, but um, I wanted to just share a concern that I'm hearing from other people, and I want to thank um, select uh, board member D uh, Dan Dunn for talking to me earlier today for a while. Um, and so I'll keep it brief. Uh, we have under eight weeks to develop a new way for Arlington to vote while shut it in our houses due to, to a viral pandemic, which is a huge challenge. And uh, we need to marshal all of our resources, all the employees whose job descriptions have been made temporarily irrelevant to build the network we need to to reach out to voters beyond the traditional ways to develop a creative and perhaps expensive way to ensure a smooth, well-run, inclusive el election that focuses equally on education, access to absentee ballots, and a safe way to return the ballot or vote at the polls. Um, it may be expensive. I'm wondering if there's money from the state that could help pay for it or money that the town is saving elsewhere that could be reallocated. Um, I also urge you to look at the League of Women Voters recommendation um, that they made at the Election Modernization Committee for a multi-platform outreach campaign to inform the voters and a working group of officials and volunteers. Um, and I thought that town clerk candidate Patty Brennan Sattel had some creative suggestions about outreach, including a self-addressed self, -address, address, uh, self -envelope to return the votes. 
Um, my biggest concern is that Arlington will fall back on their traditional channels of communication, which is the traditional media outlets, town notices, town emails, the Arlington list, and that the result will be disenfranchisement of the Arlington voters. And a quick just uh, example of this is I see that the language is to send a request for an absentee ballot to the clerk's office and you take a photo and then you send it as an attachment. Like I know my parents would never be able to do that. <laughs> So I worry that that's what we're telling people to do. I worry that people are not going to be able to do that. Um, and also, I just want to say that uh, there are times that our town needs to decide who we are and what we stand for. And this is one of those times. If we are really the welcoming and inclusive town that we think we are, then we need to show it. And this is an opportunity to do that. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Chapdelaine, Diane appears to be muted. I am on the There are two other, uh, James O'Connor and Beth Malofchik have since raised their hands. Okay, and then after that, I'm gonna, James, uh, who was first, I'm sorry. James O'Connor. James O'Connor and Beth Malofchik. Because techni te technically, if you're in the room at the time and if you're not, so, but, uh, so this will be the end of the list, Malofchik. Mr. Uh, O'Connor, if you could, uh, for the audio record, state your name and address, please. James O'Connor, 63 Overlook Road, Chair of the Election Modernization Committee. Having heard the prior comments from uh, folks that did attend our Zoom meeting last week, we did have a recorded text and a video which is on the town Zoom account. And I can, um, with your help, figure out how to make it uh, available on the Election Modernization Committee webpage, as well as uh, the materials that we discussed from uh, presenters, the League of Women Voters and Patty Brennan's Hotel, um, were made available as part of the uh, documents to be discussed during the meeting. Uh, it was constructive and I think overall uh, 27 people attended. Um, most were really pleased with the participants and uh, Janice Weber, our assistant clerk, was very attentive and responsive to trying to meet the needs of the resident concerns that were mentioned. So I just wanted to let you know that People have asked me whether we're going to have another meeting of the Election Modernization Committee. I was even asked if we had any substantive authority in making recommendations about the upcoming election. And I said, no, that was not our charge, but we would offer this open forum opportunity last Tuesday to discuss the matters. So all of that is a public record and I appreciate um, any input or questions that may come to the committee for its recommendation and or support. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Beth Malofchik, if you could just for the audio record, say your name and address, please. Um, is Beth, Beth, you'll need to unmute yourself. Thank you. Beth Malofchek, 20 Russell Street. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak tonight. I very much appreciate Citizens Open Forum. And I'd like to give a shout out to James O'Connor, who ran a very um, uh, excellent meeting last week. He um, was a master of both the technology and the protocols. And again, the public at that meeting was very appreciative of the opportunity to speak. I would just uh, uh, further emphasize what the prior speakers have shared, that it is a meeting um, 
video, whether ACMI has it or not, well worth watching for the board. I um, respectfully suggest as well as any citizens and residents in town. Uh, Patty Muldoon's comments, and she referred to a document is excellent, were excellent, comprehensive, and I think she had some very well thought out and thoughtful suggestions. So those are um, all of the comments I have tonight. And again, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, thank you. And uh, just because I feel like I should do things in threes, I, I just want to ask Mr. Chapdelaine if, um, and then this will be the end of the list if anyone else, because uh, I, I can't see the wave feature, if anyone else in the third round is waiting. Uh, there, there are no additional hands raised right now. Okay, thank you. And again, um, I believe, I know when we get to the next agenda item, we'll start to begin to address and we'll have to continue to address what was raised, very good points in Citizens Open Forum. Citizens Open Forum is now closed. We go to agenda item, uh, COVID-19 response update. Uh, I want it before I turn it over to the manager, um, in light of the remarks from Citizens Open Forum, as well as uh, conversations I've had with the manager, with the moderator and others, um, the same concerns were raised um, and there's been a preliminary email exchange um, similar to what all the speakers said before that, you know, this is an unusual election and it's gonna have to be the usual things that are done, but also some unusual ones. Um, and uh, at the end of this, at least for one part of it, I'm gonna ask a motion from my colleagues to um, authorize, empower our town manager in sort of being the conduit or the person bringing the various groups together for the additional outreach that we need to do. Um, I, I know I've spoken about, uh, you've heard that the election committee, election modernization committee has a specific charge, but I do know we have to do creative ways, number one, in getting the election out and getting out how you, um, actually do do the election. Um, I think Envision Arlington would be a, a good group in terms of helping us with the outreach for getting citizens and, and the like involved. Um, I think the town manager sort of quarterbacking overseeing all this. Um, it's unusual to bring um, the town manager in um, to an election to this capacity, but um, I have discussed it with him as well as the select board does have a role also. It's sort of in the mechanisms of the election in terms of number of polling places, securing polling workers, making sure people who come to vote and people who work the polls can do so safely. Um, but I, I agree um, with the rest of my colleagues that in other pe people who called in, there's a lot more outreach we have to do and a lot more discussion and involving citizens. Um, Mr. Chapterlain, did I sort of encapsulate that, what we've been discussing? Uh, yes, you did, Madam Chair. A absolutely. W would you like me to to begin my my brief update? Um, yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, and I'll I, I'll leave it to the board's further discussion in terms of how they would like uh, me and other town staff to proceed in terms of assisting uh, the town clerk and the board's office uh, in terms of the election and the concerns that have been raised by residents both via email and during Citizens Open Forum tonight. Uh, I, I'll start by saying, um, I know a few of the uh, residents who just spoke uh, raised concerns specific to our preparation or our response to the uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic. And what I'll say is uh, we've been managing this from a public health point of view right from the start. And what we do when we receive requests for consideration is we discuss those with our leadership team, which includes our Director of Health and Human Services, our Director of uh, Public Health, our police chief, our fire chief, as well as myself. Um, we also have represent, uh, representation uh, from the economic development coordinator, other members of the planning and IT staff from a community outreach point of view, as well as the deputy town manager, Sandy Pooler, uh, and the HR director, Karen Malloy. So the suggestions that were raised tonight in terms of education about proper wearing of a face mask, as well as sanitization of certain areas in town, uh, I can bring up with the leadership team tomorrow and from the public health point of view, determine um, what the right approach might be. Uh, building upon that, I'll add that our Board of Health staff continues to work uh, seven days a week, uh, nearly 12 hour days in managing a response to this crisis. 
Uh, as I think many uh, folks on the call probably are aware, our case count uh, as of today is now up to 87 positive cases in town. Uh, and what our Board of Health staff is doing is not only advising us in terms of the restrictions um, and enforcing those restrictions with various businesses across town, but they are contact tracing um, uh, people who may have been in contact with those positive cases. Uh, it, it seems as though you know, we, we're pretty confident there is community spread, not just in Arlington, but throughout the region, but it's still very important to trace contacts and try to limit that spread and break the line of transmission in town. And that's the important work that our really incredible team at the Board of Health and Health and Human Services is still doing, again, uh, seven days a week, 12 hours a day, um, to try to do, their, do our best to fight this, um, fight this outbreak. Uh, we meet again um, virtually 12 o'clock every day uh, to discuss what our message will be that day. Uh, the board probably saw, as well as many residents probably saw today, we announced requiring grocery store workers, pharmacy workers, and convenience store workers to wear masks while working. Uh, also uh, issuing a strong recommendation for residents to wear masks whenever they're outside or visiting those stores. And we're also asking residents of senior housing that whenever they are coming to congregate areas, in those senior housing complexes that they wear masks as well. So we'll continue to monitor this. We'll continue to issue guidance as things go forward. We'll continue to determine whether, um, whether or not further restrictions are necessary on a daily basis. One thing that we're continuing to monitor is uh, the use of the bike path and other recreational paths uh, and whether or not uh, based on the, the intensity of usage, if it's a safe uh, thing to keep it open. So far we have kept it open uh, we are also receiving requests to give to con consideration to widening sidewalks, um, not physically pouring more concrete, but eliminating parking in certain areas to give people more room to walk uh, and have safe social distancing from one another. And that's something we'll try to take action on this week uh, and see where and how that might be possible to try to give people options uh, throughout town uh, of where they can walk and get exercise while still being safe um, and, and practicing safe social distancing. Uh, finally, we're trying to con continue to find ways to connect with people in town and answer questions and allay concerns they have about this pandemic. Tomorrow, we're uh, going to launch our first virtual town forum. Uh, this one will be focused on small businesses and nonprofits. It'll be at two o'clock. Uh, the, the Zoom access is posted on the town website. Uh, it'll be a webinar style uh, event, just like this meeting is. And this will be the first of what will hopefully be a series of these. We'll, we'll likely do another one for small businesses and nonprofits. Uh, we'll do one for residents in general. And we're also working with the superintendent to organize um, a virtual town forum in regards to education and how the school system is, is dealing with this crisis. So I think I'll stop there and then obviously answer any questions that the board might have. Okay, thank you. Um, would anyone like to... Uh, Start first, uh, comments on around the election, what myself and the town managers discussed, or um, I'm seeing. Uh, yep, Madam Mr. Chair. Yes, Mr. Don and then Mr. Kiro. Mr. Don. Uh, sorry, Joe, if I jumped in front. I just, with five people, I don't, I'm just not in the habit of uh, using the electronic hand waver. Um, so I did have a, a couple, uh, several good conversations about uh, the election today, which, uh, which, and they were, it was kicked off with a very useful call that with Elizabeth Dre that she mentioned earlier. And um, one of the things that I've been, one of the things that I've been thinking about since then is that uh, we kind of ha can ha think about the election as having two tracks, I think. One is the track that we consider like what I'd call our regular track, which is, uh, people show up at the polling locations and they vote. Um, and the tricky part there is that like, it, it, it still can't be exactly like, obviously can't be exactly the way that we've been doing it. For instance, it doesn't make sense to uh, bring guests into Chestnut Manor and we're gonna have to choose additional locations for, for that. And in my conversations uh, with Marie Kropelka, who is traditionally the person who chooses those locations and identifies them, she was already ahead of that and thinking about what the alternatives were uh, for those locations. And she also felt like she was going to be able to get enough poll workers. And of course, all that is just presuming that we, you know, the health situation and the regulatory situation is such that we can have a, an election on June 6th. But for the moment, let's assume that that's true. But then we've got this second track, and this is one that's kind of new to us. I mean, not kind of new, it really is new to us, which is the uh, remote uh, or, or the, the absentee ballot version or the mail-in version, depending upon which one you want to call it. This is going to be the first election in Massachusetts where you don't really have to explain beyond saying COVID-19 why 
Uh, whereas ordinarily you'd have to say, oh yeah, I'm out of town or I'm unavailable. And so we have an opportunity, it, there's a way here that we can really um, beef up that alternative, call it like an alternative way to vote. And I do think that the town manager's office is uniquely suited to help us with that. Uh, what with um, particularly like Joan Roman, the public information officer, and also I think some of the um, IT help and also some of the other office uh, and uh, Doug Heim, of course, the town council. And so I do think it's really appropriate to ask the town manager to in particular, uh, um, I, I, I don't want to limit it to this, but in particular to ask the town manager's office to help with what I'm calling the second lane of voting, the absentee lane of voting. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. Mr. Kiro. Thank you very much. I, I think my sentiments are very close to um, to uh, Mr. Dunn's. I mean, there there are a couple of issues um, at uh, play here. I mean, the first the first issue that's been raised is um, about getting out the word about the election. Um, and I'm recalling back to last week's meeting. It's actually you, Mr. Dunn, who who referred to this as a public-private partnership, and I think it, it very much is so. Um, getting the word out that the elections is kind of a public-private partnership between the town, where we set the election date and we're administering um, the elections and using those traditional uh, communications channels to, to uh, get out the word. The media, that would be yourarlington.com, the advocate patch, and uh, ACMI, as well as um, <clears throat> advocacy organizations like the League of Women Voters. And then lastly, it's campaigns and candidates. And this is where I think that Arlington is gonna be operating at a, at a great advantage because we have such an engaged um, citizenry that um, this is the first time I ever remember that there are contested townwide uh, races for every single townwide office, not to mention almost every single precinct for town meeting, which means those candidates and those um, campaigns, both incumbents and those who are, who are seeking office are important partners in this as well in uh, getting the word out. It can't all fall on the town. We all have to be working together on this. The second piece of what we're dealing with though is, is as, as you rightly stated, Mr. Dunn, um, it's the administration of the election itself and that's traditionally a partnership within town government between three, really three different parts of, of um, town government. Strictly speaking, in elections are the purview of the town clerk, the board of registrar, the registrars of voters. The select board plays a very important role in um, selecting staffing and running uh, polling stations. And of course, we set the date of the election and thirdly, the, the town manager and manager staff does play a role in um, a lot of the logistics around elections as far as uh, facilities are, are concerned, as far as um, uh, details are concerned and, um, and, and such to make sure we have a smooth running election. So that's a partnership. So I think, Madam Chair, what you alluded to uh, in um, suggesting that, that we um, ask the town manager to, to serve kind of as a, as a point person to help uh, coordinate between those three parts of the town government, as well as the, the um, volunteer um, uh, advocates like the, the election modernization committee. I think that makes, makes sense to have someone who can actually speak across them and come back to us with any recommendations that our board has to take, take um, action on. What does make this so different, and just to reiterate what Mr. Dunn said, is I think the whole mail-in mechanism and option is something very different. It's really, it's a two-step process where a lot of people, most people are used to voting in purpose, in person, and now they have to take two steps. They have to, you know, submit or get their, their um, application for a ballot and receive that ballot and then get that ballot back back to town hall. And um, I think when we all knew when we were looking to to move the election and when the, the uh, state legislation was passed that, that uh, public education is going to be important just so that people understand that they do have that option um, 
uh, available to them. So I'm going to be looking for some recommendations on 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 how we can creatively and, and efficiently, you know, cost effectively, make sure that that information and that process is as as um, as smooth as possible within legal um, le legal parameters. Um, so I. I, I don't know if you're looking for a motion, Madam Chair, to to ask the the, the manager to serve in that that role for us, or um, um, yes, from discussions with the town manager, that would be appropriate, especially around this important issue. Okay, so I I would like to um, I would like to move that that we uh, the select board direct the uh, manager to liaise with the um, the 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 clerk's office. Our our board board staff, any of his, any of his staff or other uh, relevant um, uh, c committees, to develop a set of recommendations on how we most effectively um, uh, remove potential um, barriers to participation for for uh, for residents um, in in the election, especially in light of the the early voting. That was very long, um, and come back to the board. Uh, with recommendations for any actions that we must take. Okay, mm -hmm. there there will only be certain actions I think that we will have to take, but but um, that that would be my motion. I know it's a little messily constructed, yeah. but we'll, um, we'll clean it up. Is there a second, <laughs> Mr. Hurd? Okay. Heard? okay. Uh, is that is that Mr. Carroll? Are you all set? The only last thing I would say is I I just want to say I I I I. Do um, agree with what the point that Mr. Harrington uh, raised. I understand that there's been some sentiment around um, cutting the the number of uh, polling places, but it does seem to me that that um, having you can either have more locations or longer hours. I don't think the law affords us longer hours, or logistically the, we can do that. So having more locations, I think, will uh, re reduce the um, uh, the contact between folks and that's all I have so thank you madam chair thank you mr hurd yeah so just briefly i was going to follow up on what mr harrington said as well is and if we can get it's a, it, to me the number of po poll locations is determined by how many poll workers we can get if we can get poll workers to staff all our traditional locations save some that need to be moved i think that's a much safer option because there's a lot less contact individually for the people that are sitting there. And it can just get, if you put too many people in one place, no matter how much controls you put in, it's hard to pr keep it completely safe. So I would definitely think as many locations, we should have as many locations as we are able to staff with poll workers. And then not to reiterate, but just on the second aspect of it, as far as absentee ballot, you know, we, it's just so important in this election to make sure that ballots are accessible. And I think this is what can be part of the charge that we're giving the town manager right now to liaise with the other departments to, if there are concerns about absentee ballots in the sense that some, there are some citizens that can't get absentee ballots based on our current policies, I think that needs to be addressed and has to be addressed right away. Thank you, Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, no, I agree with my colleagues. And just focusing on the second aspect that that Mr. Dunn identified with the remote voting, and and you know we this, this is going to be new. It's essentially no excuse absentee voting. And so, to the extent that, that we can work with the clerk's office to um, provide assistance, if it's if it's welcome, and and through our IT department to to get links to a the the application the absentee ballot application is on the clerk's website right now the secretary of state actually has a, a an early ballot application which which is going to serve the same purpose but that that i'm sure will be going up this week and and section or chapter 45 um that that allowed us to move the election actually allows for any form of communication expressing a desire to vote to be used in the same manner as a uh, absentee ballot application so so it's really notifying the public and, and, and making sure that, that people know whether it's the absentee ballot application or it's a, a request that, the, that they can obtain the, um, a, a, a ballot. Um, and then on the, on the other point, just on the notice, and again, going back to chapter 45, one of the things that we can do, and, and actually it was in, 
contained within chapter 45 is providing notice to the public that we have changed the date. And we've already done that, but there's more to be done on that. And if there are changes in the number of polling locations, um, we should get that word out. And there were a number of, I'll, I'll call it suggestions in chapter 45 that we can follow and, and consider and, and actually go beyond those. So um, I think this is a, a good idea and, and we'll need to all work together to make sure that the word gets out. Thank you. Um, and Madam Chair, uh, both, oh, I'm uh, sorry. Uh, Mr. Hurd, Mr. Curo, and uh, Attorney Heim all have their hands raised. Mr. Hurd? Yeah, just a question for Attorney Heim based on what um, Mr. DeCorsi just said. Under the law, can we make it so people can just email a request in to the clerk's office for an absentee ballot? So this, uh, Madam Chairman? Y yes, Attorney Heim. Thank you. So this has been one of the more frustrating pieces of what we've been trying to deal with in terms of a disconnect between uh, the special legislation that was passed and the sort of law generally. So folks can email a request for an absentee ballot. The problem is, is that there's supposed to be some kind of signature affixed to it. People can email, they can fax, they can write, but under the law, and this is on the Secretary of State's guidance on the Secretary of State's website for folks who want to check it out, they're requiring there to be some form of a signature. That's, I think, what a reference was during Citizens Open Forum to a picture being attached to uh, an email is that they, the Secretary of State basically is saying that you need to have some way of showing that you've signed this document. They're not necessarily saying that you have to fill out the application in the same way for the quote unquote early voting, but what's really a mail-in voting ballot. But the problem is that functionally speaking, you've still got to provide some form of signature which is why I think um, the assistant clerk has been recommending that people fill out the form and attach it as a PDF. But the reality is the law says something that's kind of confusing. It says you can communicate in any form, but then the secretary of state is also saying you need to have a signature affixed to it in some way. And they're not necessarily talking about that slash S electronic signature. So it's a little bit, it's a little bit tricky to um, communicate to folks that yes, you can email, um, a request, but you've got to have some kind of signature attached to that email. Okay. Mr. Hurd, all set? That's it. Yep. Um, Mr. Caro? Yeah, just quickly, I, I, I j just um, remembered um, that uh, it should be noted we have do have precedent for uh, sending out postcards with. Um, with uh, special notifications when the uh, Stratton School was being renovated and we had to temporarily relocate um, precincts 13 and 15 down to the, uh, to the rink. I know that uh, postcards were issued to um, each of the registered voters within the precinct. So that, that I just put that out there to, to remind us all that there is some precedent for, for um, methods of notification. It's just not the, um, the mechanism for, for voting. So thank you. You're welcome. And I, I was in the office last week and uh, the framework of that's all been set up, including um, we needed to get a new printer because Chuck and Nancy Pappas um, have moved on to Florida. So uh, that's already ready and, and uh, ready to go um, pending the results of this vote. Attorney Heim. Thank you, Madam Chair. The, the, the one other thing that I, I wanted to note for folks, because I think this is, is very important. The other legal constraint that we're sort of dealing with and trying to get a little bit of either flexibility or clarity on is that folks may remember, it wasn't that long ago, maybe last year, that we sent out some communications that were candidate statements by town meeting members. That issue was vetted with the Office of Campaign and Political Finance, who sort of gave us an okay on it because they were town meeting members. And a lot of the ethics and campaign finance laws don't really apply as clearly to town meeting offices as they do to other elected offices. The, as a general rule, the town's not allowed to expend town money uh, in support of a political candidate. I understand and I'm very 
warm to the idea, the policy idea behind, can we provide some way of letting people know uh, about the candidates for all the various offices that are contested? The dilemma is figuring out how much latitude the Office of Campaign and Political Finance will give us. Because as I said, they were okay with us sending out these sort of town meeting member candidate statements because that's kind of substantively different than some of these other offices um, in their eyes. Uh, these are obviously extraordinary circumstances. So that's something that I'm, I'm happy to work with the, uh, the manager pursuant to your vote, uh, the clerk's office, um, and some of the uh, town organizations to try to figure out how we can best support these things in a, in a, in a legal way. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Heim. And um, I guess to sort of wrap it up and then um, sort of recraft the motion and make sure we get it right. Um, having the town manager sort of the, the leader of a team because we do need a team. Um, all the different um, town offices, select board, town clerk, town manager, as well as um, uh, I'd like to engage um, Amazing Arlington. Uh, well, I would make the suggestion to the town manager to uh, look at Amazing Arlington in that campaign um, that um, Kelly Linema and Adam Karofsky, I think, are, uh, have started that along with Envision Ar Arlington. Um, uh, there are a lot of things that we need to do. Um, uh, I think in terms of absentee ballot or if it's called voter mail-in, um, how you can vote by mail, how you can vote by person and how we publicize the election. Um, I'd like to get as like everyone else would as much information out there as possible. Any sort of vetting we can do um, before we actually put an option or options before us um, to make sure, and I don't know how we can't do that on everything, but um, I'm sure we could get somebody that's, you know, might say I'm kind of computer challenged and we say, you know, we have an FAQ sheet, frequently asked questions. What do you think of those? And there may be terms of art or certain phrases, whether it's technology or other that um, we might assume because we all know it and we've been doing it for so long. And again, I think that's where we're going to need all the involvement of um, if it's appropriate, if the town manager says through Amazing Arlington and the framework that they've set, set up in each precinct, each neighborhood, Envision Arlington and, um, and anything else along the way that um, either any of my colleagues uh, and Attorney Hines um, uh, part that he's gonna play in this. So um, on a motion by Mr. Kiro, seconded by Mr. Hurd uh, to appoint uh, our town manager as liaison to um, begin to bring together the aforementioned town offices as well as um, citizen um, committees. Um, is there any further discussion on that? Uh, Mr. Kiro, did I get close to what you wanted? Or did, thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, um, any questions or comments? If not, on a motion by Mr. Carroll, seconded by Mr. Hurd. Attorney Heim, roll call, please. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Sorry. Mr. Kiro. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Ms. Mahan. Yes. So that's a unanimous vote, 5 0. That's agenda item four. We'll now go to um, agenda item five discussion and vote. I asked the um, town manager when he received communication from Senator Freeman um, regarding the uh, le resulting legislation that's currently come out. <laughs> There'll be more coming in the future um, that the board have a discussion and vote on any of the um, possible forms of relief um, that we want to avail of ourselves of. Um, before I turn it over to um, Mr. Chapdelain, I am, did have a brief conversation with Mr. DeCourcy. Would this be an appropriate time for you to um, speak, Mr. DeCourcy? Well, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I think maybe it may be more appropriate to hear from the town manager first and then I'll, I'll offer um, some comments. Okay, so I got Mr. DeCourcy first. So with that, uh, uh, turn it over to our town manager, Mr. Chapdelain. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so, so as you said, uh, this was a municipal relief bill that was 
um, championed by some of our local legislators here, Senator Friedman, Representatives Garbley and Rogers, as well as championed by the governor, signed, I think, maybe um, just about a week ago, maybe a little more than a week ago now, provides really wide sweeping relief for municipal government, um, from, ranging from town meeting postponement powers being expanded for the town moderator, budgetary um, flexibility being provided to cities and towns, uh, as well as what we want to talk about tonight, uh, the ability to push back certain tax payment dates, uh, as well as the ability to waive penalties and interest for certain payments due to the town. Um, there may come a time uh, in the next few months where we want to come back and talk about certain parts of the budgetary flexibility that this relief bill has granted. I think it's premature for us to talk about those things now. Um, if we are able to conduct a town meeting before June 30th and put a budget in place, much of those flex, uh, pieces of flexibility will not be needed. If we are not able to conduct a town meeting before June 30th, we may need to come back and revisit some areas. Uh, and I think it's just too soon uh, for us to be able to know, um, to know about those matters today. Uh, however, we do want to recommend uh, certain areas of relief uh, in terms of tax payment dates and certain penalties and interest. So this was, um, this was put together by Deputy Town Manager Sandy Pooler in consultation with Treasurer Collector Phyllis Marshall. They're both available on the call tonight. Uh, with the Chair's discretion, I would ask Sandy to talk about the recommendations that he's made and then uh, potentially answer any questions that the Board might have and respond to Mr. DeCourcy's comments as well. Certainly. Um, we could have our Deputy Town Manager, Mr. Pooler. Hello. Can you hear me now? Yes. Very good. Thank you. Um, so as Adam mentioned, there is a comprehensive bill that uh, provided relief on any areas. Sections 10 and 11 of the bill uh, are what we're going to talk about tonight. Section 10 allows us to change the due date for our fourth quarter property tax bills, to make that due date June 1st, and uh, recommend that the, and request that the board go ahead and approve that. Um, this would give people a little time to get their tax payments uh, made, um, and I think a reasonable amount of time so that we will still get our payments in end of FY 2020. Section 11 uh, was, uh, basically the waiver of payment of interest or other penalties in the event of a late payment of a whole array of different uh, payments, including excise tax, generally assessments, water rate or annual sewer rate charges, uh, that, that may appear. Um, we are recommending that um, board go ahead and approve this section as it applies to water and sewer bills so that mm -hmm. those would be due on uh, uh, essentially June 29th. Um, we are not recommending uh, at this time, although we're certainly happy to discuss extending the due date for the tax bills or uh, the excise bills to a later date, uh, mostly because of cash flow issues, uh, make sure that we get enough revenue in before the end of the year. Um, and I think to some extent, to the fairness to people who have already paid their bills. Uh, that is, uh, those are our recommendations and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. And I know we have our treasurer, I believe we have our treasurer collector, um, Ms. Marshall. Um, if, if you're available, just, I assume naturally, since this is your recommendation, along with Mr. Pooler, whatever needs to be done out of the treasurer's office remotely, you've uh, sort of started to ponder that? Yes, we've been discussing that and we've been um, looking to uh, continue to keep things operational, but we are working on how those matters can be addressed and how we can um, meet our needs. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Attorney Heim, did you have anything you wanted to add before I go to my colleagues or any advice? 
No, I, I think you guys have the recommendations of uh, the treasurer and uh, the deputy town manager as well as the town manager. And um, I just note that the legislation is fairly broadly written in terms of uh, its terms and, and I think affords a little bit of flexibility in terms of the items that are being recommended uh, and the items that are not. Thank you. And if I could just ask Attorney Heim one question before I turn it over to my colleagues. Um, if the board chooses to make motions either on these two matters or one, two or more other matters, could should it be one motion or should it be separate motions? Uh, these are, thank you, Madam Chair. These are technically different sections of the same uh, legislation. I, I would recommend two motions with respect to um, basically tax bills versus um, any uh, waiver of penalties and interests. So that I would separate into those two camps. And if there's a third, would it be a yeah. third separate one? Like, uh, the, sorry. Attorney Heim. Thank you, Madam Chair. So yeah, the, the, the sort of do, the, the, end, the end due date for different bills versus the penalties and interest is how I would separate them, my recommendation. But I leave it obviously to the board's discretion. Thank you. I'll uh, stop taking a list, but I'd like to start off with Mr. DeCourcy. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, thank you to Mr. Pooler and Ms. Mar Ms. Marshall for the for the memorandum and, and the explanation there. Um, I'm going to make a motion and then I have a couple of comments and in, in, uh, following Attorney Himes' uh, recommendation, I want to break it up into to two motions. The first motion um, being pursuant to Section 10 of Chapter 53 of the Acts of 2020 that we vote to extend the fourth quarter payment deadline for real estate and personal property taxes from May 1 until June 1st. And then for purposes of the exemption application filing deadline, um, that we extend that from April 1st to June 1st. Uh, and that's for purposes of chapter 59, section, uh, chapter 59, section 59. And those are personal exemptions that uh, the deadline actually is April 1, but by extending it, people who may have missed that deadline um, mm. can avail themselves of that. And, and there is a, a complete list on the assessor's website of, of what those tax exemption programs are. So I encourage people to take a look at that. Um, the second piece is under se section 11 of chapter 53. I move that we, um, vote to, to waive penalties and interest for the late payment of water and sewer charges for those payments that were due on or after March 10, 2020 through June 30th. Um, so they'll, they'll make the two motions. If there's a second, I have a couple of comments. Second. Okay. Seconded by Mr. Hurd. Um, we're gonna do them separately. So uh, I'm gonna take that on your first motion regarding section 10 chapter 53 of the acts of 2020 there's a motion by mr de Corsi, seconded by mr hurd uh mr de Corsi, on the first mo part of your mo first motion yeah so so in the first part of the motion is, is you know we, we have a fourth quarter tax payment deadline coming up and this just allows people an extra month on that through june 1st consistent with the legislation and then the other one was on the exemptions um, my comments were really related to the second half, so I'll, I'll hold off on um, you know, talking further until it uh, goes around the board. Okay, Mr. Hurd? Yeah, so I definitely support moving the due date to June 1st, um, particularly since, you know, probably the bulk of residents that pay their property taxes separately are elderly, elderly residents. And this will relieve the burden on them a little bit in doing so. Um, question, I don't know, Madam Chair, who this would be addressed to, but do we have an idea whether or not mortgage companies who escrow for taxes for, for homeowners are still going to pay on May 1st? Or if, this would, if we pass this, if they would defer that to June 1st? Attorney Hine? Oh, I think, right. I think either Sandy or Phyllis could answer, answer this. This is one of the main uh, okay. points of consideration they gave in making this recommendation. So I, I, between Sandy and Phyllis, I think they can answer pretty well. 
Okay, Mr. Pooler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we've already received a, an email from the largest mortgage uh, company payer asking if we are going to postpone the dates either to June 1st or to the end of June. So we think that there's a large chance that uh, the mortgage companies will delay payment. Uh, I think that would most affect them. In other words, they'll sit on the money until they pay it to us uh, and not be a benefit to the homeowners. So that was one of our concerns. One of the reasons we recommended yes on 10 because uh, it seems fair but extending it farther, we didn't think necessarily it was going to help uh, a lot of people. And um, Ms. Marshall, is that something you concur or, or agree with and or anything else you'd like to add to that? Uh, Madam Chair, we, uh, we did discuss that and we have had a couple of contacts from mortgage companies, uh, escrow companies, excuse me. Um, looking to get that information. I believe they sent the, sent those emails to um, maybe all of the towns. Um, and, and we did have that concern um, that Sandy outlined. Mr. Pooler. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Herb, is that satisfactory? Yeah, I, you know, I guess that makes sense, in, especially in light of the federal legislation regarding deferment of mortgage payments to allow the same courtesy to the to the lending institutions but is I mean as long as I'm sure Ms. Marshall and Ms. Pula would have made the recommendation if we we're going to run out of money by June 1st so you know I'm good okay Mr. Dunn uh, I support the motion no additional comment Mr. Carroll uh, no additional comment I support with the motion thank you Okay, um, a motion by Mr. DeCourcy, seconded by Mr. Hurd to adopt Section 10, Chapter 53, the Acts of 2020, um, as well as uh, state the filing deadline shall be postponed from April 1st to June 1st um, for the purposes of Section 59 of Chapter 59. Um, any further question or comment? If not, uh, roll call, Attorney Heim. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Curo. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Ms. Mahan. Yes. Unanimous vote on uh, the aforementioned Section 10 um, motion. We now have, first we have a motion made by um, Mr. DeCourcy to waive the penalties and interests uh, for water and sewer charges um, with those charges for payments that were due on or after March 10th, 2020. First, there's a motion by Mr. DeCourcy. Um, do we have a second? Second. By Mr. Actually, Carroll. I think Mr. Hurd already seconded it, did he? Well, he no. did the first one. But okay, separate. second. Oh, all right. Okay, sorry. I probably should have done it that way also. Um, first, uh, Mr. DeCourcy, did I encapsulate correctly your motion? And then any other comments? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just a couple of quick comments. And, and uh, again, going back to the, to the memorandum, um, I think it makes good sense to, to limit this waiver at this point to the water and sewer charges. However, I am concerned that there are people who are going to have difficulties even with the June 1 date and bearing in mind that we want to make sure that we can pay the town's bills for the month of June. Um, this may be something, just speaking for myself, that, that maybe we could revisit depending on what the payment levels is, look like as of June 1 or, or, or shortly thereafter. The other thing I want to point out just for the public, this waiver applies provided the payment is made by June 30th. If you don't make the payment by June 30th, actually the waiver goes away. So it's a it's a it's an additional 30-day waiver for water and sewer, but it the amounts have to be paid during the month in order to take advantage of that waiver. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Carroll? Uh, no, no additional comment, thank you. Mr. Dunn? Uh, no additional comment, I'm happy to support the motion. Mr. Hurd? 
Nothing further. I support the motion. Okay. Um, I also agree that we may need to um, revisit this June 1st, as well as uh, I'm sure either myself, Mr. Chapdelaine, or Mr. Dunn, um, under new business, will speak to uh, new CDBG news that we've received, besides the initial allocation that the subcommittee met and um, with uh, the town manager and planning director and the citizens um, on the committee uh, presented a plan that will be no later than May 15th on a select board agenda, but also um, I had contacted Jenny and Adam initially when I got uh, some information from HUD about what the uh, Federal CARES Act stimulus package would mean for Arlington CDBG because that meant another um, influx of funds. Um, and it's, uh, I think, a pretty substantial amount that I'm uh, certainly happy to get, but can't speak any further into that until the CDBG subcommittee meets. So perhaps um, that's something CDBG subcommittee discusses um, because there have been a little bit of uh, changes in terms of the formula and how you can apply it. So on a, uh, an, an Attorney Heim or Mr. Chaplain, anything else you would like to us to add? You would like to add? No? Okay. On a motion by Mr. DeCourcy, seconded by Mr. Curo, to uh, waive the penalty and interest for water and sewer charges for those payments due on or about after March 30th, 2020. Any further comments or questions? If not, uh, Attorney Heim, roll call. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Kiro. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Ms. Mahan. Yes. And uh, with that, I would, uh, in the spirit of Mr. DeCourcy's um, and my other colleagues' remarks, uh, I'll continue to work with Mr. Chapdelaine about um, other parts of uh, this legislation that came out that needs to be addressed or readdressed at a future meeting in the interim that I am, I am still chair. Um, Cause um, come June 1st, as my colleagues have said, uh, there may things, be things we want to visit or revisit um, depending on uh, how things are proceeding along. So I'll make sure along with uh, town council and the town manager that we, when we have our Thursday morning conversation, we'll bring it up. Do we need to bring some of this back again? And then we'll determine from there. Is that appropriate, Mr. Chapdelaine? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, we will, that's agenda item five. We now will go to agenda item six, approval letter of support for all America Road designation from the Federal Highway Administration's National Scenic Byways Program. Our town manager, Mr. Chapelain. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is a, simply a letter of support for the board that we're asking for the board to consider signing. Uh, we're not, uh, or frankly asking the board to, to be part of nominating the Battle Road Scenic Byway for the All America Road designation. So as the letter outlines, the Scenic Byway, uh, which runs through several communities, was uh, uh, designated a Scenic Byway in 2006. And now there's an opportunity for the Battle Road Scenic Byway to be designated as an All America Road. And uh, this is request has come from the Scenic Byway Committee, uh, drafted by the Economic Development Coordinator. And we're looking for the board's support in uh, approving this letter and signing on. Uh, first, do I have a motion to approve by? Move approval. Oh, is there a second by? Second. Mr. Dunn, um, any further? Um, Mr. Kiro, any further comment? I'll just say, I think that once um, once all the social distancing measures lift, there are gonna be a lot of people looking to take road trips. So I'm happy to be in the list and <laughs> come through Arlington. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dunn, any further comments? Questions? No, thanks. Uh, Mr. DeCourcy? Uh, no, no further comment. And Mr. Hurd? No further comments. Um, I'm really excited by this. Uh, started many years ago, along with uh, my then colleague, who became our, our colleague again, um, Ms. Rowe, um, when we first started going to these joint meetings with Lexington and Bedford and Concord and Arlington and, and getting everything designated. And I remember we were at a meeting one time and I commented a uh, to uh, a woman from the Lexington representation. I said, I really like that 
you have uh, maroon as your colors up here uh, in terms of their design. And she turned to me and said, oh, my dear, that's burgundy, not maroon. So Clarissa and I had a lot of fun from that meeting on. Uh, so this really is an important designation. And when we can all get out, the road trip is no longer, you know, going to the front of the post office to put your mail in that secure thing. That's a big thing for me. Um, if no further question or comments on a motion moved to approve by Mr. Carroll, seconded by Mr. Dunn. Attorney Heim, roll call. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Curo? Yes. Mr. Dunn? Yes. Ms. Mahon? Yes. And that, my friends, is a unanimous vote. Um, we now go to agenda item six is closed. We go to agenda item seven, discussion May 2020. Um, Board meetings, um, wanted to just do May. Um, I, I'll speak personally. I think the June 6th uh, election day is in my mind still kind of fluid. Uh, so I figured we'd do this uh, a month at a time. I know people, uh, I've got several emails why we weren't going a little bit further than that. And I see the pros and cons, but I'd like to um, with my colleagues uh, approval just do May for right now, unless um, one of my colleagues thinks we should go beyond. Um, so our next meeting would be April 27th. And we don't have to necessarily do this on a Monday night. Um, we do have Memorial Day, uh, the 25th. So um, would someone like to throw out two dates? Or should we start with four and 18? That seems the most natural. How does everybody look for May 4th, Monday, May 4th? Mr. Dunn? Uh, I, th I don't have anything on my calendar at this point for any of these days because I have the obvious reasons. Um, the only thing I'm thinking about is, and I don't think we're probably ready, necessarily ready for it tonight, it's just uh, we probably we still have a handful of town meeting article hearings left to do and uh, figuring out how to get those in may be the hard part. Right. Um, I a know lot of words to say any day is good for me. Okay. All right. And um, we have uh, CDBG, the regular, the regular allocation CDBG public meeting we need to have by May 15th. And then we'll have this subsequent um, Federal CARES Act CDBG funding, um, which I assume would have on the same night. So um, I'll, Guess I'll go forward with right now. I'm hearing from Mr. Dunn, and then I'll check with, lastly with Mr. Chapterlain. Um, May 4th and May 18th work for you, um, Mr. Kiro. They're fine, thank you. Mr. Hurd. Both dates work for me. Mr. DeCourcy. Both, both dates are fine. And um, our town manager, Mr. Chapterlain, are those two dates fine, or do you want to suggest something else? Or those two dates work for me. Okay, all right. So, um, and what what we have left, sort of on the on the platter to clean up, is the CDBG public hearing and the five um, resolutions um, proposed by Ms. Thornton, um, who I know is first in Zoom. So, um, I'll endeavor to. Perhaps we can do it all in one night. Perhaps we'll split it up. So, so uh, next regularly scheduled virtual board meetings are May fourth and May eighteenth. And we don't necessarily need a vote for that. So we will now go to new business. Attorney Heim. I just want to um, echo a lot of the comments that other folks have made, uh, thanking uh, the folks who are working so hard in the health department, uh, our first responders. Um, I also want to thank uh, my workers' compensation staff who are responsible for line of duty claims and have been doing a terrific job of trying to stay on top of things to make sure that any of our injured workers are still getting paid and that payroll is coming, it, it keeps going through. So thank you. Thank you. Our town manager, Mr. Chaplin. Hi, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just building on what you mentioned earlier, uh, there is from the, the federal uh, stimulus bill or federal uh, bill that was passed several weeks ago, a pretty significant influx of additional CDBG money the town will be receiving. Uh, approximately $600,000 to help us in the response to this crisis. So we will be meeting with the CDBG subcommittee on Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. 
recommendations of that committee, of course, will be brought back before this board, but um, just wanted to build on your comments from earlier. And that's all I have. Thank you, Mr. DeCorsi. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just briefly, uh, you know, I want to echo comments made earlier, thanking our um, health department, our first responders, and thanking healthcare workers in general um, for all the work that they're doing during this crisis. And, and I, I heard a quote a couple of weeks ago, Governor Cuomo was actually quoting President Roosevelt and, and I had a couple of discussions over the weekend, one with a healthcare worker, one with a police officer. And, and uh, just made me think of the, the, the courage that they've all shown through this. I'm gonna leave you with a quote. Um, and, and the quote from President Roosevelt is, courage is not the absence of fear, but rather the assessment that something else is more important than fear. I think that really sums up what, uh, what all these, these workers and first responders are doing and I, and I wanna thank them for that. Thank you, Mr. DeCorsi. Mr. Dunn? Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and uh, no new business. Mr. Hurd, I'm trying to remember where you normally sit, Mr. Hurd. Yeah, just again to reiterate to thank everyone that's been working so hard to keep people safe and just to remind people that a lot of our restaurant establishments are still working hard to provide takeout and delivery services. We've been using a number of them and they've been really doing a great job to continue to provide food services for the town, but in a self, uh, healthy and safe way. So continue to patronize our businesses. Mr. Kiro. Hey, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just wanted to just remind everyone that, you know, this weekend we won't have uh, the marathon. We won't have the Red Sox. We won't have the Patriots Day Parade or the reenactment or the visits by uh, Paul Revere and, and William Dawes. But, um, you know, we do have a lot of people, as, as, as all my colleagues have, have noted, who are um, working hard to defend our community against the, this um, new threat um, right now. Um, I think you, you all know that um, uh, my brother is a first responder in another community and he did uh, test positive as did others who worked directly with him, drove home to me. He's, he's doing fine now, but it drove home to me just the real, very real um, risk that our first responders um, and our grocery workers and our healthcare workers um, are taking, it's real. Um, so thank you to them and thank you to all of the residents who really are um, working hard to, to follow the social distancing guidelines and to, um, to, to keep others safe. We're, we're, we're gonna get through this, but uh, we, we need to all row uh, together here. So thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, for myself, um, again, the uh, influx under the Federal CARES Act of CDBG money, um, I, I anticipate we'll have conversations around uh, the guidelines that not have been relaxed, but um, that we have to follow in terms of assistance to low income renters and businesses um, here in Arlington that really uh, are definitely, everybody's hurting, um, but um, there's been a, a, a lot of issues and a lot of relief put in there. And I think with this influx of money, perhaps that can also happen as well as the, um, we got noticed that, um, which I had a feeling that our CDB subcommittee meeting this would be the case, the solar panels um, um, that has been canceled as well as some reprogramming funds. And I know when Mr. Dunn and I were in the subcommittee, um, there was conversation around Arlington Eats. So I'm going to endeavor um, to, I think that would be an, an appropriate discussion for possible use. Uh, the only other thing, two things I would do is first, um, I do want to thank ACMI, Jeff Monroe and Sean Keane, um, who have been going through this process, with, not only with the select board meeting, but with other, other meetings, school committee meetings, uh, as well as their involvement in our unusual, possibly June 6th election. I know they have candidate profiles. If you go on to ACMI's website, you go on to the government on demand feature, there's individual candidate profiles. They've begun um, some debates and we'll have debates for all the town offices um, that the candidates agree to. Um, and, and thank you for, uh, people have said that the select board's doing a great job with these virtual meetings. And um, I, th I think ACMI is a num number one leader partner in making us uh, get the information out and, and 
really good semblance of order. The other thing besides thanking all of our first responders, um, I would say to everybody at home, you know, if you if you can think of those first responders who really are out there and playing against the odds and having to have, I mean, when I say myself and my colleagues and the manager and town council are staying at home um, and practicing social distancing, but we're doing that um, because especially for our loved ones and our friends, but also for, for the citizens, the residents, and our town employees who um, basically put themselves and more importantly to them, their families at risk, um, going out, doing their job, keeping us safe and making sure this, um, this town runs uh, efficiently and safely. So, and to that end, um, if I had my way, the bike path would have been closed a couple of weeks ago uh, because it's, I don't know how any part of the town fitness program, a lot of our public works, police, fire employees, that used to be part of their training, whether uh, uh, cardio or, or bicycling. And um, I haven't been out there, but I've heard story when I've gone to, to the popular crossroads, um, whether it's going through the center or certain parts of the bike path in East Arlington and the Heights, um, I do not see social distancing out there. And the town manager and the uh, Director of Health and Human Services um, are really monitoring this very well. And I put something out this weekend. Please pay attention and follow the advisory. If you must use the um, bike path, please social distancing, recommendation of the masks. Um, Arlington, we're not doing a great job on that. You know, if you don't necessarily have to exercise on the bike path, you can walk around your block or two or three blocks. Um, but I, my personal opinion is if the use, especially when the nicer weather comes, um, the town manager and his leadership meetings, honest to goodness, discusses the same thing every morning that they discuss the morning before, the morning before. The only thing being different is something new. Um, and um, I'm not saying an action will or will not be taken, but um, I can kind of see the handwriting on the wall. So if we don't change our behavior, uh, Stop throwing your gloves and masks in parking lots in the gutters. Uh, I, I just don't understand that. Um, and honest to goodness, we're all, it's tough for me as not only the politician, but the cheerleader in me that wants to get out to events and cheer people on. Um, but you really must um, listen to the guidance from the town. And with this warmer weather, um, you're going to have to work three times as hard to do that. So with that, um, our next scheduled meeting is uh, Monday, April 27th, 2020. With that, I'll take a motion to adjourn by Mr. Dunn. I move that we adjourn. Is there a second by Mr. Kiro? Second. On, on a motion by Mr. Dunn to adjourn, seconded by Mr. Kiro. Roll call, Attorney Hine. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Kiro. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Ms. Mahan. Yes. Good night, Arlington.